series of events that the University of Applied Arts Institute of Architecture is undertaking today. I'm very happy to moderate this first panel, which focuses and represents a couple of uh, the IOA's finest <laughs> alumni. <laughs> we chose them by hand. And um, first of all, I'm very happy that some of them really take a long way, coming from the United States, from Estonia, Germany, and I'm very happy that you're all here with us today. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce them as they were writing themselves. So on your very left, we have Thomas Fitzke, born in Hamburg, 1975. He's a founding partner of Fitzke and Bosnemann Architects in Hamburg. Thomas Fitzke studied architecture at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna in the studios of Wilhelm Holzbau, <laughs> where we met, by the way, uh, Svi Hecker and Zaha Hadid, and after his diploma he worked um, for Zaha Hadid Architects for more than 12 years, first in London and then in Hamburg prior founding VBA. From 2011 until 2013 he was guest professor at the Institute of Digital Design Techniques at the University of Kassel. From 2013 to 2014, he was appointed international guest professor at the PBSA in Dusseldorf. Thomas taught and lectured in various international schools of architecture, such as the Illinois Institute of Architecture in Chicago, the AA in London, the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, the Leopold Franzens University in Innsbruck, University of Applied Science Hanover, and the Harbor City University in Hamburg. Welcome, Thomas. Yes, <laughs> applause. Sile Pilak, born 1985, is co-founder of PART, which is the practice for architecture, research and theory, and a PhD fellow and junior researcher at the Estonian Academy of Arts. Uh, she was half the curational team with Seem Tuxam behind the TAB, is it TAB or TAB? TAB. TAB, I'm sorry. 2015 main exhibition bodybuilding and TAB 2017 installation competition. She is a Met Master of Architecture with distinction from University of Applied Arts, the studio Rashid, and has gained experience at the Southern California Institute of Architecture and a number of architecture and design offices such as Morphosis in Los Angeles and Copimold Law in Vienna. Silla has also participated in various international exhibitions, worked as architecture associate editor of the monthly Murilet, and her works are included in the permanent collection of the Museum of Estonian Architecture. At present, Silda is co-curator of the Open Lecture Series and lecturer at the Estonian Academy of Arts and a member of the Union of Estonian Architects. Welcome, Silda. <laughs> Nora Graw, born 1982, is an associate architect at the German office of Hen, based in Berlin. She taught a diploma unit at the Architectural Association in London and has worked with Enrik Wiesgeli and his studio Cloud9 in Barcelona. Nora Gross studied architecture at the Technical University of Brunswick and the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, where she graduated from Greg Lin's studio in 2009. As a graduate, she applied to the Tisch Scholarship to join Cloud9 in Barcelona, where she compiled and directed the office research agenda. As a unit master at the AA, this research was continued starting a diploma unit in 2010. During that time, Nora developed exhibitions, art interventions, and multimedia installations, such as the projection mappings on buildings. Joining Studio B, now HEN, which is a 350 people offices. One of the largest. One of the largest. Uh -huh. Well, that's quite big. And um, in 2011, she is mainly responsible for the early design phase, leading competitions and conceptual studies for the German as well as for the Chinese market with typologies for office and high-rise, commercial, cultural buildings, and master planning. Further, Nora was involved in compiling the DRX, Design Research Exchange at HEN, a residency program for researchers. Welcome, Nora. <laughs> Julia Körner, without a birth date. <laughs> 1984. 1984, okay. Is an award-winning designer working in the convergence of architecture, product, and fashion design, specialized in additive manufacturing and robotic technology. Her work stands out, recognized at the top level of these disciplines, 
where it has been featured internationally in world-renowned museums, institutions, and publications. She is founder and director of JK Design, and her recent collaborations involved 3D printed fashion pieces developed with Haute Couture, houses for Paris Fashion Week, and the Hollywood entertainment production such as the Marvel superhero blockbuster, The Black Panther, which is, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> Julia, wow, 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 wow. Julia is a graduate of the Architectural Association in London and the University of Applied Arts in Vienna. She's a faculty member at the University of California in Los Angeles since 2012. Welcome, Julia. <laughs> Vicky Sandor, born in Hungary in 1990. This is quite interesting because, Thomas, you were born 1975. 1990. So that means that you were four years old when Kurt Cobain shot himself. Yeah, oh, nothing, to do with that. nothing to do with that. Okay, good. In 2010, Vicky uh, commenced her studies in architecture at the University of Applied Arts with Wolf Pricks and Hani Rashid. She joined the Energizing Vienna crossover studio where she got engaged with the topic of climate and densification. During 2016, um, she was working on the permanently temporary in the age of gravity independent architecture speculative projects for the future of the city which emphasizes her main interest in the field of architecture temporary architectural systems in urban environments since 2017 summer she has been involved in a society in motion three-year summer school program as teacher and organizer and together with uh, anton falkeis who is present welcome anton <laughs> Um, at the University of Liechtenstein and Bergen School of Architecture. Vicky is, over that, working together with Colmot, which is a research team in drone flight designing and, and is a part of Hellowood Design Studio in Budapest. Welcome, Vicky. <laughs> and to your very right, it is uh, my pleasure to introduce Peter Pichler. He was born in Italy. Bolzano in 1982. He studied architecture at the University of Applied Arts in Vienna and at the University of California, returning then back to Vienna and graduated with distinction from the masterclass of Saha Diet and Patrick Schumacher. It was not really Patrick Schumacher's masterclass, was it? He was involved, he was involved, let's say so. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, already during his uh, studies, he joined Saha Hadid in London, where he worked on several competitions covering all scales and on the award-winning Nordkettenbahn in Innsbruck. He spent a while in Rotterdam working for Rem Kolhas after turning back to Vienna and joining the team of Dilogan Meisel, collaborating with them on an award-winning concert hall in Amman, Jordan. After finishing his diploma, Peter went to Hamburg, where he worked for Saha Hadid. Did, did you work together? Yes. Yes, okay. okay. He was your boss. <laughs> Times are changing, huh? <laughs> 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 and, um, oh, where was I? Um, and on a, on a big development in Vienna and uh, in Bratislava. He turned back to Italy and established Peter Pichler Architecture in Milan. Uh, Peter is a registered architect in Italy and a member of the Chamber of Architects and the Autonomous Province of Bolzano. He was nominated as Young Italian Talent by the International Chamber of Architects in Italy. Welcome, Peter. <laughs> now, I'd like to start this with a very short introduction based on... Uh, can we close the door? Which pavilion is that? Kids coming in. Um, I was very happy this year for um, accidentally taking part in a very interesting weekend which was uh, hosted by Rolex. It was called the Rolex Arts Weekend in Berlin with uh, several very interesting um, events. And one of these was the panel discussion led by Harvard professor Homi Baba on the question of do we have the right architectural and artistic education. And on this panel there was Tatiana Bilbao, Anish Kapoor, William Kentridge, it was Fergus Lehan and um, a Bulgarian writer Miroslav Petkov. And alongside these discussions, which was very nice, um, William Kentridge introduced his Center for the Less Good Idea, which I find super interesting, under this pressure of constantly succeeding, 
that someone establishes a center for the less good idea, but probably we'll talk about that later. Um, it was Miroslav Petkov, a Bulgarian writer who constantly teaches uh, um, creative writing at the University of North Texas. And he told us a funny story because the Board of Education in Texas would ask all the teaching staff to deliver a kind of um, idea of what marketable skills they would teach their students, illustrate and prove them. And I would like to ask or revolve the question, is there still a market for the skills that the Angewandte taught you? Sille, please start. Um, there's definitely a market and a need for those skills. And those skills as, um, as what we have been trained to become um, uh, design architects, but uh, also constantly exp experimenting, not uh, going on the, uh, not going for sure. That means uh, finding new, new ways to approach was actually the essential thing when returning three years ago, re returning back to Estonia. Like, what would I do with those skills that I got from Angevant or from Morphosis or from Coop? How can I contextualize this knowledge? And, um, or where is the you know, available machinery that could produce those ideas or what's the material that could um, be deformed in those ways? Mm -hmm. So um, I, what I'm doing now is uh, actually looking at algorithmic design processes in timber architecture. And uh, just because we have one of the biggest uh, and most advanced timber industry with uh, five axis robots, etc. But we're still producing these um, buildings um, designed by non-architects or like uh, designed without no design, log houses. So I guess that's uh, how the, the really the experimental and um, fresh approach towards architecture, what I think I gained from uh, Briggs and Hani's teaching was, uh, is now being transformed and contextualized, but definitely necessary in order to make a change or innovate. Julia, would you agree? Um, yes, I, I agree. Uh, I think uh, one thing what uh, Greg Lynn always used to tell me um, when I was a student at the Angewandte, he said, what we are teaching you now is going to be relevant in 10 years. And in a way, back then, I did not yet quite understand what he meant by that. But today, I know, because um, it's almost 10 years since I graduated. And I definitely use the technologies and um, skills that what uh, we learned at the Angewandte in my everyday um, work and uh, work environment. So. We focused a lot on emergent technologies such as 3D printing and um, CNC machining. And today I use these technologies interdisciplinary and work in cross-disciplinary with uh, product design and fashion and architecture and try to really implement the technologies um, into real life and therefore have the opportunity, at the, I would say, on a smaller scale to realize the digital and computational designs uh, on a one-to-one -one scale. And uh, I am also looking into how you can scale some of these applications um, into the architecture scale. But uh, I would definitely agree that the skill set, what we learned, and uh, is, is what um, is a marketable um, idea. So, but just for the fact that you both work independently in, let's say, small offices that you found yourselves? How is that in very big offices as yours? I mean, marketable skill. Um, I think the market is asking for innovation. And this is something that we, I'd say, in, in regards to design, learned in the, at the Angewandte. So how, how can we produce innovative uh, ideas and experiment within design and this is something that applies or can be used in, in a small or in a big company. It's always the market. The market always wants innovative ideas and I think that is something that is uh, probably the most marketable skill I would see in the education that we received 
at the University of Flight Arts. Vicky, would you agree? Well, uh, innovation for sure, it's really important what, like, what Angevanta is teaching you, always coming up with new ideas. But uh, on the other hand, I think it's also quite problematic now I see myself, being just after my studies, that it's, it doesn't give you one direction where to innovate. So you are constantly opening a lot of doors and you, you learn how to be adaptive to a new project and you learn your new skill the way you want but then it's really hard to decide later what is really the direction you want to go. And I don't know if this is good for the market or, or how to deal with that, especially when you want to get into an office, you have to close some doors, which the projects which we, we are addressed in the school is not really asking for. I mean, it's, it's like education starts to be really open and then once you are out, you have to close. And I think that's a, a bit of tension, <coughs> what I feel at least. Peter, as, as your office obviously like moved like a rocket over the last couple of months and years, how would you see that, um, not necessarily the marketable skills, but the urge for innovation that has been trained at the University of Applied Arts, how to incorporate these skills and concerns in the work that you do? Um, I, think, I think the innovation, sorry, I think innovation, what we learned at school, especially at the Angewandte, uh, is crucial. At the same time, I really think that uh, you learn your work while practicing. So you learn when you work in offices. I think that's one thing. Um, another thing is, for example, my story is I came from a very technical high school. It's called Geometo Schule in the place where I come from, in Bolzano, which is a very small town in North Italy. And I had this vision to study architecture somehow. And I didn't know anything really about it and I decided to go to Vienna and was the first year at a technical university and I really came from a very like I didn't understand anything about architecture but thought I have a lot of technical skills due to this very technical school that I did but my innovation was like zero like there was the, this was just like blocking me totally and the first I remember the first semester I did at the Theo Wien uh, the tutors there said, uh, you should just, uh, you know, uh, it's what you're doing here. I started to design details, so drawing like details in scale one to five on a university project, which by the way were really bad details, and uh, they didn't make any sense. So then actually through the cousin of my, of my father, which is, uh, you probably know him, Walter Pichler, the artist that uh, died uh, a couple of years ago. And through him, actually, he was like telling me, like, why don't you go to the Angewandte? Like, why don't you try there to go it? And, and I think it's, uh, you know, give it a try and, and uh, do the entry exam. And that's what I did. And when I came to the Angewandte, the first thing what also Patrick was telling me is just like, forget all your things, what you have like learned, let's say, from this technical school, this Gemeto Schule, and the first year of let's say, uh, TU and start from scratch. And I think that was the point for me where I actually um, started to get interested in architecture because I, see, I saw it from a totally different point of view. And, but to come back to, this, to the skill set, I think uh, the Angevand is very a great, great school mm -hmm. like to really um, learn about contemporary architecture, learn how to design and all the skills that you learn there. At the same time, I think practice is very important. I think you cannot just study five years at the Angewandte and then come out and do your studio. I think that's very difficult. And it's not just difficult, but another thing I wanted to say is about every creative work we do right now, um, what is very important is the business part of it. Because I think every architecture office should be a business as well. It should be something that, you know, is a kind of a mix between innovation. Like innovation is crucial, but at the same time, you cannot create any innovation if you don't have any projects where you can also, you have clients where you get money, where you can do things because, and that's very important. So I had, in my case, the, the, advantage, to meet, the advantage to meet my wife, Silvana, which is here. So she's doing all the, business part in the office so I can be more the creative part and I think 
uh, that's a good combination. I think both of it are important. Directly? Be nice to your wife. <laughs> Be nice to your wife. <laughs> Thomas, you're facing the same problems in within your office, in your, within your work, or is it just... I think, I think um, um, in addition to, uh, let's say, this idea of marketable skills in, in, in material innovation, digital innovation, tool innovation, etc., etc., for me was very important at the Angewandte to, um, to learn how to work in teams and not only uh, small teams but larger teams and in very diverse teams and also afterwards in, in Zaha studio with great and talented teams and uh, with Peter and so many people that um, came there all with their own uh, let's say uh, character their own skill sets and so on internationally and then to to talk and uh, create a productive um, workflow with these teams because when I remember when I did the diploma after doing this teamwork of two only for the diploma uh, I think there was a little incident where one of the professors stood up and said well you cannot have your diploma in a team here in this school because you know I'm born in 1975 so that changed then afterwards but I think this change was really good that and and for me these kind of skills that are more uh, dialogical skills, communication skills, skills of, um, um, cre of working within a very diverse um, and global environment. Uh, what you start learning at the Angewandte via the projects, because they are oriented at uh, international topics also, international content, sometimes large-scale um, interventions in in metropolis uh, worldwide and so on. I think this is a really good foundation then to uh, stay within a business that only works via team. Yeah, that doesn't work through one kind of uh, genius mind, but works in this kind of teams that are diverse and that are also very um, kind of very productive once you know, the, the, the setup and the management of this kind of uh, works, creative workflows is done right. And so this is something I think I would like to stress a lot, this kind of soft skill of uh, having a productive talk, you know. And I think this is what, what you learn in, in, a, in a large class within these project-oriented uh, works. Actually, I would add to that that's definitely something that I, I miss a lot as well, having so many talented people all the time around you, day and night, because that's what often happened, um, whom you can always keep up the discussion. So it's not only between the tutor and the student, but, uh, but you have those uh, all over the world, people coming to Angev and uh, different cultures, multicultural, uh, different approaches to understanding what the space is and then you're, you're constantly with them and then there's always a discussion and I think that's, that's really exciting um, about this kind of uh, quite uh, specific, unique, uh, but then again, um, really wanted schools to be in. So it's the, the, the level of discussion is totally different than I've experienced in other schools. I believe this kind of project orientation that around one project you cluster also all the, these disciplines and the way how you understand the project in the kind of school at the Angewandte is a central, very complex, uh, evolving thing that you know that is, is uh, also emerging from a lot of uh, various neighboring disciplines and this kind of wholesome approach. I think this is uh, then also this was very important then in the large office of uh, Zaha Hadid and so on. So you know to put the also the intensity of work, let's say the intensity of living and eating and sleeping and uh, not sleeping in the school is something that then you know you can uh, somehow it's like uh, in sports. You know you want to be a very good athlete, so you that's your life and that 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 kind of. Um, 
practicing and training period, I think is also something that is uh, a good foundation. The, maybe if I add to that yeah. also, the intention um, that during the studies you also have these um, a structural engineer mm. that consults you mm. on your project, mm. on your studio project. This is something that is very, it's, I mean, how you work in an architectural office, whereas you then sometimes even have in a large firm a lot of this knowledge also in-house um, and working in teams where you can have different expertise um, feeding into your project and developing from there um, a thorough idea. That is something that started to to be done in, in or that is done in uh, the University of Applied Arts, much more, which is much more project um, based, the studio, much more than in other universities, where, for example, as you were saying also before, Peter, in a technical un university where I also studied before, the design studio was completely disconnected from all the other disciplines, so you had to know about. Um, yeah. MEP and yeah. structure and so on, but it was disconnected from your uh, project, design project. And in, in reality then, you That's go out, the outside the school and sometimes you have this uh, some, somehow um, contrast, you know, there's the structural engineer, the, the Statiker, yeah. and der will immer alles, he wants to do everything like uh, very stiff and rigid and so on. It's a, it's a prejudice, but this prejudice I never had in practice because I was so used to, you know, there is no building without a structure and then you can use the structure early on in the design process and maybe even create a kind of very important aspect of your project out of that and that then became even, you know, that became part of projects that you, that structure becomes expressive as an example and then it becomes a kind of part of cultural expression and of the expression of the building and so on and I think this is something very and it's really the truth that this is one of the is one example but it's one of the examples where always I had this big kind of respect for the various people that are contributing then to the project and that I think leads to you as being capable of also directing a team in a good way and a successful way. That's so good to hear, Klaus. Huh? Obviously, we're doing a great job. Structural incorporation. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm interested in now, as, you, as you're saying, and I mean, I, I experienced that myself. First, you work in teams, then you do your diploma, then you work in teams again in big offices, probably. But what happens as you found your own office on yourself. Peter already told us it's, the business part is quite tricky, probably the legal part is tricky, all the regulations more than doubled in within the last 20 years when it comes to building. We are not really uh, used to that while doing the student projects, even in consulting them. But what happens then? So I I think, um, as Nora and Peter already mentioned, also I studied at the University of Technology before and then did uh, also another master at the AA. So I do agree with you that the kind of multiplicity of experiences, both educational and practice, uh, is really important for the, like how we evolved in a way and working today. But towards your question, um, I think beyond collaborating within a team in, in your own office or in a bigger company, it is also important that we learn how to col collaborate beyond uh, with other people. So in my own experience, I have collaborated with fashion houses um, and uh, fashion designers and product designers and um, definitely the experience, what I learned at the Angewandte helped me in these collaborations because I learned how to work in a team and also how to add and bring in the architectural process into these collaborations. And so I think that in other industries, um, such as the fashion industry, for example, there isn't so much a collaboration or teamwork. And I think for that, um, we as architects and what we learned at the Angewandte is really important. I think uh, in terms of 
what kind of knowledge you learn at, uh, for business or legal and so on. Um, as you do, I also have a, a partner, uh, Kai Ravi, who is here today as well. I, he Welcome. <laughs> he also uh, works together with me in the majority of the projects on this part and uh, working with like big uh, companies like um, Marvel and, uh, and big uh, haute couture houses in Paris, you really do need to have some knowledge and, and you experience very, very quickly what that means. And um, I, of that part, I didn't learn much during my education, but you learn very, very quickly when you actually work um, what, what that means. And so I think um, that's definitely an important part, but. It's, I would also argue that it maybe is difficult to learn that um, while you're a student, because when you're a student, you, all you care about is design, and you really want to like develop during the five years at the master class like your design and really focus on like your design language and aesthetics. I, I was never so interested in these other topics because I wasn't aware that that would be so important. And also, when you then work in real life and have your own company. You, it's also so specific from one project to another. It really depends on the client. So it's always, especially when you work with innovation and uh, novel technologies, there, there are situations where there's just no set example where you can look at. So I came across um, situations where there was no reference to look at because no one had done anything like that before. So I kind of had to design and craft my own, um, like, business or legal approaches to this. Vicky, uh, could you tell us a bit about this, uh, this Hello Wood studio in Budapest? Is this even teamwork Clo right. close to that, what we are talking about? Uh, first of all, I'm really fresh there. Basically, I'm working there for a week, but it's <laughs> Tell <laughs> but us more I can, about it. I can tell a lot about it. So. Um, this is a team, like really young Hungarian architects, who started the workshop series a few years ago. And uh, the idea was that they go in the, to the countryside every summer and they build a wooden structure which is designed by students and their teachers. <clears throat> and I think now there are several universities who have this special class, so for a semester they are preparing for this workshop in the summer. And meantime, <clears throat> they also got some projects, like wooden furniture in the urban uh, space and they started their own design studio. So yeah, it's one month projects, really fast designed and uh, fastly buildable or like it just appears and disappears. And this is what my interest in that um, studio is really, that it is an addition to the urban space and just happens to be there for a while and then it's gone. And yeah, I find it really important general nowadays in, in bigger cities to have this dynamic architecture also happening on the streets. So yeah, that's what they are doing out of wood. <laughs> um, probably I'm wrong, but I sensed over the last couple of years that there is a certain kind of, I wouldn't necessarily call it banalism, uh, but urge for rationalism and efficiency in within the contemporary architecture, which is quite endangering our school and the, and the merits that we derive from that on the formal or um, device, I would, I would really say. Um, do you think that still this is, as we were talking about the marketable skills and about this innovative aspects our school is still transferring, that uh, with the things that we learned and still try to move on with, I'm especially looking at you, by the way, coming from Saha's studio <laughs> and then, and then uh, setting up an own practice in Hamburg, do you think that this is really mediatable in a, in a bigger field, especially when we walk through the Giardini probably? Is this what we teach still valid? Yes, um, I believe. <laughs> Uh, that you are on the one hand now referring to a very particular kind of stylistic um, development. While I was, you know, that uh, is then the kind of uh, also the style of uh, Zahadi architects, and I think there is, uh, um, is uh, you know, th there's a very particular case, you know, th this kind of stylistic. Uh, precise stylistic development from also maybe uh, d 
deconstructivism and to parametricism and kind of an ism um, becomes, of course, very. Um, uh, you can attack an ism very easily, of course. Um, at the same time, I believe that that this is not what uh, I was taught. Yeah? This is. I can do all this repertoire. This is something uh, that is, um, you know, you learn at the Angewandte, we, you, you mentioned it. We, I, for, for example, I learned at a very different professors there, and it's totally different. And this somehow already set up uh, with, with in um, my view on, on architecture, a very kind of, um, you know, the, the idea of expanded uh, repertoires and so on. So it's, I, I don't see that there is just one uh, way I en enjoyed, in fact, the kind of, the, when the Angewandte was a kind of very <coughs> pluralist in terms of um, style directions and in terms of what is the main aspect of uh, teaching in, in one class uh, in comparison to the other, maybe one would be more interested in the kind of functionality of, of housing, of plan, of, uh, and, 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 and so on. The other one then would be more in, interested in developing a certain uh, uh, technology. But all this richness you will always find in the world of architecture. And I think there is no way that you can start at one point saying, OK, now all of this is dogmatically uh, ruled out and we just want to go in one direction. I think it's never going to happen and you see that. But it's also not going to happen uh, with the uh, what you call banality. You know, It cannot happen, it must not happen. One thing that you are taught at the younger one, which we don't talk, which we haven't talked about, is uh, this, that you, uh, you're taught a certain courage yeah, to do uh, stuff that is not marketable, maybe, at one point, you know? It's like, th therefore, I think this, this initial question, you know, are you taught marketable skills? If you are truly coming from the school, you would ask, uh, first of all, uh, marketable skills? Why marketable skills? You know? what, what is this? And, uh, and, and this kind of reflection, I think, upon whatever also is happening within the school, this kind of, um, discourse, the criticism, also then the kind of criticism maybe of certain developments. This is also something that you, you, you know, you have to still be, be aware of. Um, and um, that's what, what uh, also will lead always to, to, to new agendas. I think that uh, now in digital uh, design, I just had to talk about this uh, last week in, in Stuttgart, about the digital building. And most of the people, you're right, Think now about digital BIM is, a, is an application of a certain program like BIM, yeah? building information modeling, uh, uh, Revit, Archicad in Germany, etc., etc. And and this comes from a management side, and then it becomes a kind of tool of constraint, yeah? of it's a corset, and it becomes a tool of quantification only. And it becomes a tool where you can supposedly build the project in the cheapest, less risky way possible. But this is not at all, um, I think, what the Angewandte has ever kind of uh, tried to uh, teach or direct towards to. But I don't think this is also the way that architecture uh, should go. And you, you know, but the opposite is not the opposite or the, the contrast to this is also not a, a, I don't think it's a very particular style. So, you know, there, there is an open, the future is always open, you know. Some, once someone starts closing the future and says, okay, this is the way and we, we create dogmas of this style and this style, I think there is a, there is a problem. This is also what I learned at the Angevant, to speak what we think. Peter, please. I mean, I remember when I was studying, it was like in the Zaha class, it was like two years in a row was like parametric urbanism. So every project basically looked the same. It was all about Maya fluids these days. It was like, you know, 
but you could get, really go through the class and there was this kind of, like there was a very high similarity of the projects. The funny thing is that when I was uh, involved in this lecture of the Angewandt uh, uh, this year where there were people like you were all invited, I think, as well. And there were, for example, two colleagues of mine, which I was studying, Markus Inauer and Andres Schenker. And they're doing like completely different things now. So what I want to say is that you cannot really learn a style at the university. I think you need to find yourself. And this is a process. I think it's not that you, I don't know, uh, you, you are studying at the Angewandte and you come out with a certain repertoire of style. Yes, you do, because you learn these things and you work with certain tools. But I still think that everybody needs to find himself what he really wants to do later, and this is a kind of process. Um, another thing what I wanted to say in terms of um, the speed of architecture, my sister is a fashion designer, she's also doing a fashion as well. And what is interesting there that she can really work on projects that she can, at least on a prototype level, realize in a couple of weeks. Where I say, like, she's asking me, so what are you doing with this project? Yeah, it's still at the municipality, not going on, you know, all these kind of problems. So, um, time-wise, I think uh, it's very interesting, for example, what you are doing, because I think uh, you can see your ideas maybe in a faster way sometimes than architecture is. And this is a little bit the dilemma, I think, sometimes, that architecture is a bit slow, I would say, compared to other industries. And, uh, yeah, I hope that it's getting better, but I'm not so sure. <laughs> so I think exactly this is what when we look around and when we go to the Angevante, we see that we just produce so fast. The, the production of form and, and design and ideas are just tick, 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 tick. And when you, when you think of fashion, then there is a place for that. But I think it's really hard to deal with where to put all these ideas then because it just then there is a wall and stops you. And then do they fade away or, or you just pick one to go for and just work it out? And I think that's a really, I mean, it's an issue now in architecture. I, I would actually argue that for me, um, the projects at the Angewandte were not really quick. Um, for me, I thought it was actually a really long time because you get um, two semesters or like one full semester to work on a project. When you look at other universities, you, which are on quarter or tri-semester um, time frame, they get much, much less to work on a project and develop your ideas. and so. Also, the duration of studying for three or five years with one, um, one creative mind, one professor, allows you to go through the different processes, learn the different tools. Also, everything looks maybe quite similar. You still, uh, you're still developing your own approach to it, and, and there are slight differences in it, and I, I think that these differences, they continue to evolve with your other influences in, in your projects. And so that allows you then to develop your own particular um, approach towards aesthetics, innovation, and um, integrating these things. And then other influences, if you work in a bigger company, um, other, other parts add to that project and make it richer. So I, I think I would argue that the, the Angewandt, you actually get a lot of time to think about what what design means and how you implement it personally into your work. But just a comment on what you said in the beginning that it's um, that the world is tending to go towards uh, more and more rational architecture. Then I think that rationalism could be uh, in a contemporary world also discussed in a, in a different way. It's not like the most rational form, but the rationality in in terms of uh, optimization, uh, uh, previous uh, like uh, design uh, studies, and uh, and also using with with all the contemporary um, 
yeah, tool sets and also the machinery available, then, um, then actually the rationality then becomes uh, something totally different. Because uh, now the, the process of rapid prototyping is, uh, is giving the possibilities uh, to go for a beer while uh, you put it to, to pr produce the model instead of uh, you actually making the model. So uh, really understanding your, your sets uh, of uh, skills is, uh, is something that's a great advantage in uh, Angevant because you, you have those uh, multiple milling rooms, uh, multiple ways of, um, of doing a model uh, always there, so it's all about getting it physical, right? Because we don't, we're, not, we're not aiming to stay or remain on screen. It's like how you get your ideas to physical realm, and, and I think uh, that was uh, really important at like, Brick Studio, t through models, we always discussed models, and then from, we continued uh, more and more on like how to produce those ideas and model scale, prototype scale, and then in a uh, real building scale. So I think, again, like having this kind of facilities uh, there has, has given a lot for a continuous process as well. So you, you, always, you always work physical. But um, we were talking about these this skills, soft skills, hard skills, about the urge of innovation that is somehow even within your offices driven. Um, to me, this is, this is a kind of tool set that you learn for Angamant, even the courage, which I find totally nice. For This is not about just giving you tools and sharing uh, a certain amount of knowledge. But, um, and this is something that, that brings me to a quote by um, Verena Konrad, our commissioner from the Austrian Pavilion. She would say that uh, under these constraints of, of, of the physical, um, we totally lack of any theory and um, let's say, strategy to really, to really fulfill these requirements on a, let's say, broader field, which then gets into the public and then gets really transferable to a broader scale, not only within the architecture, let's say, um, little group that we discuss here, but to really come up and do something reasonable for the public on a bigger scale, which refers to a lack of theory that we might not only have in school, but as, as well in your practice. So this would be probably my next question. How much uh, would you self um, conflict with uh, recent programs and, and, and theories in, within your everyday practice as you doing such great things on a, for the market, for the physical, for the, for the fashionable? Is there a certain uh, agenda of yours? Well, first of all, I think um, that in the Angevanto or then in the offices that anyone here has worked in after school, there is a lack of the. I, I feel that these offices that are mentioned, that were mentioned, are more like they do a bit of philosophy with material. You know, so there is the physical, but it's in, in fact very idea-led, and it's it's very very um, also in a way. Um, effective in the public because all of these buildings like uh, Cope's buildings, Zaha's buildings, uh, uh, Tom Main's buildings and uh, the, the work, even the, the uh, other disciplines, the, these are kind of almost popular cultural icons, you know, that are, um, that are created and so they are very, very um, in the focus of, of the public. And I think there's also a lot of connection uh, with theories because some of the, um, uh, of, of the proponents of these architectures are also very interested in uh, creating philosophies uh, around the, 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 the architecture. I think what is uh, important is that you keep this up in your, in your practice and to somehow extend this dialogue and to meet up and, uh, you know, to, to to continue spinning these kind of networks where you can have a discussion and you can have a reflection about what you do. So that's why I always welcome and I, you know, I like to be part of these discussions. As um, this might be easier in larger office environments, but in smaller office environments, you know, you can, uh, if, it, if it's too small, you talk to the mirror and you have a monologue with yourself, but uh, you need this kind of 
networking and this discursive connection in order to keep rolling. I mean, this is totally central. Um, maybe in regards to Hen, uh, one of the uh, looking at theory and also research, um, Hen, because it is, as we mentioned, such a large company, has the opportunity to also launch research programs, as mentioned before, as the VRX, which is a um, design research program which is, as the name already says, linked very much to design. So it's, it's um, kind of similar actually to the way that um, we used to work in the studio uh, and Greg Lynn, where, but one was, the thing was, the idea behind it was that we bring um, academia and practice together. Instead of going to the university and teaching a studio, we were saying that we bring in um, PhD students and from various fields, they were not only architects, but also um, mathematicians, for example, and structural engineers. And we brought them in and hosted this in-house in uh, Berlin, this research program. We set the agenda, we mm, raised the questions, and it was very, mm, the first one was very design driven, but we noticed that with the agenda of the, uh, the, let's say, theoretical agenda that the office has, which comes from Gunther Hen in regards to especially his um, take on communication and communicational space within architecture, which he's teaching in, in Dresden, we started shifting um, topics uh, a bit away from a much more design approach to a more, let's say, theoretical approach. Um, we also included one of our in-house, let's call it, uh, departments. It's a technique that Hen developed, which is called programming, where we, before a project even started, clients can come up to others, us and say, um, we have a we have a question, we have a problem. Like, um, for example, uh, we're not working well together. What can we do? We need to um, communicate better. And then with this question, when we start this technique, which is a, um, which is called programming, it's a it goes through interviews um, with the client of not only the head, but also employees working for them. And we try to extract from that the, the core values and the core problems that they have, and only then we're starting the actual project. This defines the project itself. So it could happen, for example, that um, for the company MAP, they approached us and said, we need a new headquarter. We, don't, we are not happy with ours and our in Darmstadt, um, can you design a new one? And we started, we said, before we start, let's, let's spend a couple of weeks and really look into what you need for that. And what came out is they wanted a new headquarter because they were unhappy with how um, innovation works within the company. They, did, they were not really innovating. So what came out of this programming then is that we proposed an innovation center instead of a, a headquarter. So this is a project place where people can go and uh, of different fields and they work together there. And I think this is, I think one of the um, one of the topics that is, um, I can see throughout all the projects that we work in Japan is this idea of bringing people together to communicate because we always work with the large uh, firms like um, Mac or VW in the automotive company and with them it's always the problem that they with so many employees they need to increase the face to face communication and this is I think the the theory or the, the, the main idea that um, is the the red line throughout all the projects. Peter, theory, everyday practice. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yes, theory, I mean, we are a very young office, so maybe it's a bit difficult to really talk about the theory yet. Um, what we think in our projects is, or what is probably one main point where we are interested is the research on vernacular architecture. So we are pretty much interested, of course, where we do a competition and, of course, we try to make a lot of research on vernacular architecture on that, in that specific location and then we try to um, somehow bring local parameters into contemporary architecture. We try to analyze local parameters, a local identity of the place or the architecture in that place and uh, we somehow try to transform it and I think we are a very young team but uh, I think we have very uh, good people and talented people in the office as well and we see now with our clients that the message really uh, is understood by the client in terms of um, when we do a competition or when we uh, have a client that comes to us and is asking us to do a building in the location where he is and we start to present him the project with an analysis of the local then he really tries to understand what we mean with that project. So we try to analyze um, very local architecture and local uh, parameters and this is the starting point of our project. And then it's like from there it starts to more evolve with more contemporary techniques to come back to the Angewandte and we try to create something new out of that. But it always has, I think, a very strong foundation to, to the local. And uh, I think, um, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's, that's very important for us. And we see it already in every project that we start now. We have work in Abu Dhabi where uh, we see that the client really respects that we go there at the beginning of a project to analyze the place for a week. We try to visit things. We try to understand the culture, I think, because it's not just about architecture. It's, I mean, it's about not just the identity of a place, it's also the identity of the people that live there or live in a house or in a building. So, um, and I think uh, this is also the, the interesting part of architecture, to understand culture, to understand um, local and somehow try to take these parameters and try to do something new out of it. I would like to add um, something more on the academic side. So, um, talking about theory and how we learned it at the Angewandte, I face very different uh, theoretical approach now in the United States where I teach at UCLA the, for the past six years and originally um, Greg Lynn brought me there to teach uh, with him the Super Studio, which again was with a focus on robotic technology and um, innovation. However, I see that there is, I would say, beyond the faculty at UCLA and uh, on the broader um, universities across the states, that there is a heavy theoretical approach um, focused on postmodernism um, arising, especially in the last two years. They even started to have their own um, biennial in in order to have like in Chicago their own biennale and, and which is disconnected from the Venice Biennale. And so I always feel like a very, um, I would say colorful bird within the faculty because I come with the very European approach towards theory and, um, and also educational approach. And I think um, that that is something which I have never been confronted before because we kind of in Europe um, have a very different approach towards theory I would say so it, it's always um, it, I, I would say there's the practice theory there's the um, academic theory but then it also there's different differences across the world based on where where we speak about this and so um, my approach towards that is that in the, in the professional work, what I do, theory in that sense is not as important as 
the statement or the design approach what we have. Um, and most of the people who are more for theoretically um, interested or have a more theoretical approach towards their work, they don't realize their work beyond the theoret theori uh, theoretical um, realm. I would actually... Uh, sorry. Just one thing that recently in a lecture of Jacques Herzog that I heard, he was like, the only thing that remains is the architecture. So if you go back to 100 years, what he said is that you can have a very bright theory, but what the people really see is what you've done. It's the physical work. So you can, have, you can be very theoretical, but if your work is just simply not good, I think it cannot be as important as I agree. Uh, I agree on what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Florian, there is There is examples who, who would uh, <laughs> doubt this saying, but nevertheless. I would sit. quickly jump on that one as well, because, um, um, well, just, I think a year ago, Estonia was claimed according to Wire Magazine, the most digital country in the world. Yet living there, I've seen no physicality in this digitality, meaning that we might have more blocks under the coffee tables, but that's as much as the space have changed. So now the, um, then setting up a company there, it was really important. Um, that's why we called it a practice for architecture, research and theory was to um, to have tif different mediums to reach the point where where new spatial qualities or or um, volumes or installations buildings would be accepted by a wider um, wider audience um, that means the society itself so uh, we started actually um, a site teaching of course uh, doing um, a lot of uh, writing articles so like being um, an editor in newspaper or uh, or just constantly have the research topics uh, involving uh, but also in not in just in terms of like research papers but also in terms of how to connect or bring architecture closer to to its user because i think it's um, it has departed and of course when when we say we could only talk about Alberti's theory, but um, yeah, architecture is the one that is there and it needs to be uh, facilitated and, un and partially understood. Then um, I've, I've, under I have, I've reached a point that I, I have a feeling that people start uh, understanding of the need of the, uh, like the potential of uh, new space and uh, what this could bring and what could be the, what could be the digital country's um, physical realm. And I think um, for this I would not be able to do that if there would be no, no theory or no references or understanding of, the, of what's happening in a wider realm of architecture there. And that's also again why I'm curating a lecture series where um, I would bring in every two weeks some um, um, good or interesting or emerging or established architects to show the projects or their interdisciplinary projects and then keep up the discussion like what is the potential of, um, of the future to come. Okay, um, before we get too comfortable, one last question for everyone. When was the last time that you failed and why? This very much references your graffiti that you did in the Holzbauer studio, remember that? Yes. Yeah, you brought that me. Was, that was a big fail. No, that was a big success. Yeah, <laughs> well, let's, let's not, not talk about that. Let's talk about failure and probably this comes back to the William Country Center of the Less Good Idea, which I emphasize a lot. And um, then you have to catch a train flight whatsoever. We'll be ending this shortly. Peter, failure, even you. <laughs> Sorry. I think I, I fail a lot of time every day, so I think, I think a funny failure was really a failure, but I mean, it was an experiment for me, but I had no clue was when I was uh, finishing uh, after the diploma, the Angewandte. I thought I need to go to New York. There was a big crisis, then I came back. And I decided to design a clothing rack 
because it came out of the blue that I thought I need to do like, I don't know, that's something that's not there yet, a beautiful clothing rack. It was beautiful, it was a total failure in terms of selling them because I had no clue how to sell product. And uh, I mean, I still have a few pieces. Uh, I think, I still, I still think they are very beautiful, but yeah, I mean, in terms of, in terms of, uh, let's say, yeah, it was not really a success, let's say. It was a big failure, actually. <laughs> But they're nice. <laughs> okay, my failure. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I have one big one in my head. So last, my diploma was based on drones flying in the city, and I, I designed a beautiful drone, right? Uh, which was based on an ETH project, and it seemed yeah, pretty, and it. They, they made it fly. So then I applied for a scholarship that I also want to build mine based on theirs. And they gave me the scholarship. So I got the money and I was ready to build it. And I went to the first person who actually deals with drones. And they just couldn't stop laughing. And they said that this is no go. Uh, I cannot do this drone because it, it's not, it was not about the, the um, communication technology which it would have required, but just aerodynamically we are not advanced enough for getting this, but, but once it will happen, just we work on it. But so I, I just didn't build that one. <laughs> oh, um, so failure, um, I would say that brings us a little bit back to what we talked before already. I think I had one failure where it was, very, it was a project where it was very limited time and a very quick project, very, very big project where I signed um, really, really big contracts uh, without having a very good lawyer on my side, um, which uh, is the result that I can't talk about this project now, which I would love to. Um, so I would say that was one of the biggest failure that I didn't have a really good lawyer on my side that day. Uh, no, it was in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> um, as Peter was saying, I'm constantly we fail, and uh, there are numerous um, examples. Um, maybe one one thing that is uh, working in such a big office, you have the possibility to um, focus on a very small. So you can gain expertise and live in your in your field and really enjoy that and be good at what you, what you do. But it also means that uh, sometimes uh, what happens that projects are then being built without me being involved or even knowing about it. That also happens. So it can happen or it has happened that I uh, got out of a, a cab for a meeting with VW and um, I entered the room which I then noticed I had designed before but I didn't know that it was built and <laughs> this is Chinese I think market. no it was actually in Germany <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is something where I would say this is one of the failures that you have to still or it is you need to keep track of what you're doing and really follow it through to the end because it was also a big disappointment I have to say to see it and it has been of course it changes during planning but it had been stripped down so much that it was uh, I would have hoped to be more involved in that. Um. Agreeing again, as previously said, constant failures all the time. But um, I have to say that one of my favorite lectures is the AA lecture of Mark Fornes about failures. And as um, he's, the, he's the one who uh, uh, is the founder of the There Were Many, and uh, building an installation, for example, as, uh, as he's very good at, you constantly produce a lot of pieces um, that with the one small mistake could uh, then end up with uh, not being able to do anything at all. So um, I have had these moments when like, constructing an installation that needs to be ready, of course, for tomorrow. Um, you have uh, 300 pieces uh, milled out, and then you figure that they're all milled just 
one centimeter too wrong and um, not able to put them together. But these are like this kind of um, failures that you, you, you learn a lot. And I think uh, even, um, even the bigger failures of um, not, um, for example, participating in architectural competitions, but in terms of failing or not winning it, is, is something that is actually where quite even eager to do. We're, we're always hunting the honorable mention, but never the first place. Because if you want to do the first place, you would have to go all commercial, or you have to do some kind of um, what's being um, expected from you that is uh, not questioning the brief, not questioning the, the site uh, or the, the detail plan that's set up, but just, um, just doing what is expected to be done. So we always go and uh, question everything, uh, then submit something. And of course, they're just like, even if we qualify for the final round, we would never be the winners because um, there's uh, just um, too many contradictions to what was set to be done. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that. I mean, we are also uh, gaining most of our work through uh, competitions, like 80% uh, of the work we have uh, gained through competitions. And this is a big kind of failing game, you know. It's like, <laughs> this is like you fail all the time. And uh, you have to keep going, yeah? you have to keep the stamina up, you have to have the frustration tolerance and you have to just then go into the next one and into the next round and into the next fight. And somehow, you know, it's then like how you fail, you know, and how much it, it lets you down. You cannot let yourself let down, but you have to go again and it's like, you know, you feel this if was a happy person. This is the way how to <laughs> deal with, uh, with this kind of discipline. And, and you will win at one point. So, um, not only because of you, I'm uh, very happy that we had so many people around here. And I thank the panelists very much on behalf of the IOA. Hope that we all learned and uh, see each other again for exchange and very much Looking forward to seeing you at the university, probably. I don't know if there's something planned. But all the best for your practices, families, and uh, the rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the organizers of this. This was really great. Thank you. Oh. And thank you, Florian.